This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal, medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Hi there, here we are. It's live at 5. It's Tuesday. And if it's a Tuesday, obviously it's July 13th. Then it's movie reviews and more live around the world. Talk for media, TV, radio, podcasting, K4HD radio, podcasting. And streaming worldwide, womanontv.tv, iTunes 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, and womanontv.tv, if I didn't mention that because I'm so fragile today. <laughs> but anyhow, I've been looking forward to this show for a long time, and so has an Andrew King all the way out of Ontario, Canada. So I got to mention him first because I've been watching him for the longest time. It's one of those things where not only does he have one, you know, internationally best-selling author, he's got two books on traveling. Uh, and I like that aspect because I used to travel when I got a chance to, but, you know, I'm stuck a little bit for the time being. But he may not be, but he's also started his, his new job, which I'm really, really happy about. And that is a travel and cruise consultant. So all the way from Ottawa, Canada, Ontario, Canada, is Andrew King. And the one and only. So we've been watching this film for a little while here. Uh, you know, a white guy walks into a black barbershop or a guy walks into a barbershop. Whatever way you want to put it, it's not boycotting sales, but it could be. You know, he's a filmmaker. Producer, director, civil rights activist, which I really like. Uh, he's done some interesting things and some amazing things. And, you know, he's brought to do me, through me by my friend, Mike Szymanski, correspondent for everybody. He's written out there back in the day, teacher at UCLA. He's done a lot of things and lover of dots and dogs. we got to mention that because that's very, very important. Very important about us dog lovers. Tasha disappeared. So singer songwriter out of Miami, Florida, vocally Tosh. And the one and only, she's late as usual, because I guess she's not stopping in place. Nonstop Terry Marie out of Renano Beach, California. Welcome, everybody. So let's jump into this, because Kyle, we got to start with you first. Let's talk about uh, your film and what's been going on some stuff. Uh, so, yeah, so my film is uh, uh, called A White Man Walks Into a Barbershop. It's a documentary, um, and it was uh, took about eight years of filming. And I drove around the country with a small crew, and I went into barbershops and churches and fraternities, any, anywhere anyone would want to talk to me, and, and, and sat down and talked openly, as openly and honestly as we could, about race in America. And that's, um, you know, and the movie's just starting to get out there. We're, hopefully it'll be, uh, well, not hopefully, it will be released on streaming services in the fall, and right now we're doing select uh, screenings around the country. And you just had a bunch of things going on in the South. Uh, talk about that. And then Mike, jump in on this once he finishes this, because it was through Mike that I got a chance to know who you are. So a couple months ago, we ended up doing a, you know, a Zoom session with you, and I found that fascinating. And I like this film. I thought it was really, really good. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, we had uh, one of the places we, we filmed was in Meridian, Mississippi. It's a small little town just uh, over the border from Alabama. And um, we were just going to stop and get lunch and continue on to a, a larger city. And there was a barbershop and we decided to stop into this barbershop, um, Jenkins Barbershop. And uh, we ended up spending three days in that town. Um, the people were there were unbelievably accommodating and, and just open with their time and their thoughts and their, and, their, and, their, um, and, and their families. And when I left there, I said, look, guys, I'm going to when we have this premiere, the first people are going to see this is going to be Meridian, Mississippi. Um, and they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, eight, seven, eight years later, we're ready to premiere this and COVID was ending and they and their restrictions open and I reached out to 
the owner of Jenkins Barbershop. And I said, listen, I promised you that we're going to do a premiere, so let's do a premiere. And he was blown away. And I said, listen, I said, I don't want to get in the long line of people who have promised um, their community something and then sort of abandon them. So um, we went down and had a, a great opening night at the very historic Temple Theater. Um, and it was amazing. And so, I got to tell you, Brian, what's what's funny is that when um, Kyle started off this project, it was during the Obama administration. And I was part of a foundation wow. that helped that helped fund this. And uh, and really, at, we were naive because we thought, oh, Kyle is going to reflect the end of racism in the country. I mean, we really I we really thought, you know, gosh, things are changing. Things are better. And I got to tell you, it's this this project is more timely than ever because things are worse and, yeah. and getting worse. And um, and I think that the 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 racism and the racial aspects are, are that that he brings up in this uh, in this really poignant uh, film are are is very important right now. Well, also the thing about that is people don't realize when it comes to filmmaking and, and especially putting documentaries together. I always say they take an average of five to seven years to make to get done, and, and because you got to raise the money, you run out of money, you got to go out there and try to find the money again. All of a sudden, then you got to get distribution. You got to get out there, get to film festivals. Kyle, you've gone through that now. You know what that's like. Is as that filmmaker, it's not easy to raise the money and get th things done, is it? Uh, I, no, no. That's always that. It's, there's two parts. There's the filmmaking aspect, and there's the business aspect of trying to raise the money, um, and. Uh, the CICA, the California Institute for uh, Contemporary Arts that Mike was a part of, they were really amazingly generous with the grant um, and amazingly patient. I mean, I don't think, I certainly didn't think it was going to take eight years. Um, they certainly were expecting something sooner, but they were always patient and always supportive of, of, of what we were doing. And it, it, it was a lot of long, a lot, it took a lot longer because, again, Mike said we sort of were thinking, okay, this is a, 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 a sea change in America with a black president, and this is what we're going to deal with. And then, uh, you know, oh, there, there kept being more and more incidences um, starting in Florida. And, 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 and we, well, we got to cover that. We got to cover that. And finally, a producer said to me, listen, we're never going to finish this movie if you're waiting for racist, uh, racist incidents to stop in this country. You've got to sort of figure that out. And over the pandemic and during the, the, the Black Lives Matter revolution after, um, uh, in Minnesota, that really solidified and, and gave me the, the sort of the, the foundation to really finish this film eight, eight, nine years later. So, and yet it was the first, it was the first administration of Obama that we started this and it makes me feel very old. And you can see me aged throughout the movie. <laughs> well, you know, talk about going down to those, those areas. And I'm sure they were really, really happy that you took the time to come back because how many times have we heard that, hey, we're going to come back and we're going to do this thing? It happens all the time, doesn't it? It happens all the time. And even when, my, you know, I, I talked to my producer saying we got to do this and they thought I was nuts. They said, well, no, there was, we're not. Let's do it in New York or let's do it in L.A. or, or even Minnesota where um, where a, a very important part of the movie happens. And I, and I was like, no, nope, we've got to do it in Meridian. After that, we can figure out what we want to do. Um, and I, I, I was thrilled that, you know, they that we did it. They, they you know, they pull out the red carpet for us. I mean, it was it was a wonderful time. I had, again, the best barbecue I've ever had. Um, so <laughs> for no other reason to have the premiere of that is to go to that barbecue place. So I, I got it, we got to ask, because this was a big controversy early on when, when you were making the film, is the use of the N-word at the very end for you to use it as a white person. And uh, what was your choice and uh did you leave it in and and how was the reaction the spoiler alert um we have a there's about a 15 minute discussion about the about that word um and we talked and and it, we talked to all the people i talked to during the interview process during the filming and it the the the, the views range the gamut to saying you should never say it uh you can say it in context they don't care if you say it certain way people can say it they have a pass they there are, there are a lot of people who hate, hate uh, sort of white liberals way of saying the n-word because that's sort of a, a workaround for saying that word and and there's a there's a moment where I have I tell a story about growing up where the only time that word was used in my in my house and it was a big debate as to do we do we tell this story and if I tell the story I have to say the word and I, and I asked most people I know what do you think and 
again, got a huge, huge, um, ran the gambit. Um, and I won't say whether I said it or not, um, but I will say that because of because of that part of the movie, um, a lot of white film festivals and a lot of white um, distributors um, are shying away from the movie. And I haven't had a single complaint from um, any black film festivals or the audience down in Meridian was 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 90 percent black. None of them had a problem with it. Um, we just got into the hip hop film festival in Harlem. Um, we're excited. So I think I think the people that are getting uh, that will be upset about it are the people that have really no say in the matter. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and it's it's kind of interesting because uh, you know, and 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 Kyle uh, has uh, been someone who uh, has uh, propagated uh, uh, a word that bisexuals don't like, which is fence sitters and being called fence sitters. And his his film uh, his film company is Fence Sitter Films, and you know he's kind of appropriated a word that. Um, Bisexuals like me and and I, Kyle uh, identify as uh, a, a word that we consider like the N word for us, if there is such a thing, and um, and uh, and don't like being called that. So you know, uh, I think that that kind of thing that uh, it, I don't know. How, how do you feel about the whole thing, Brian? I mean, how did you, how did you feel about uh, the word? And I didn't have a problem with it because it was the way he was telling the story. Uh, I, for, for the record, I never used the word. I mean, I grew up in a time where you weren't supposed to use that, so I don't use it. I don't like it being used. I feel uncomfortable when it's used, being used around me. I mean, I'm watching a film now where it's being in, used on, on epics called The Godfather or Holler with, with Forrest Whitaker. It works in that because it's the time that that was being shown, you know, portrayed and everything like that, but we'll get into that part later. But it's one of those things where I just don't use it. But it's, it's, it's very interesting. One of the things I wanted to talk to Andrew King on, on segue into this, because a lot of authors are always wanting to have their books turned into a film or a documentary. And it's one of those things where I always tell everybody, you know, don't expect it to happen instantly. That's not how it works. You've got to get the rights. You've got you to get cast. And you've got locations, uh, a pandemic. <laughs> Anything that could happen could be the worst thing that could happen. So, Andrews, tell us about your books, first of all, one, because this, this whole industry was shut down on something that you love to do when it comes to traveling. But also, you're one of those authors where you would love to have your books turned into a film, right? A documentary, right? Yeah, definitely. To be able to kind of explain cruising to others and being able to show people what is really out there in the world to see and to go and explore. So the one thing about Andrew is I've been watching him for a while. So he started traveling with his family, whether it was to, to the Caribbean or overseas to Europe. Um, and then he ended up writing a couple books about that. And they both ended up becoming international best-selling books. Talk about the travel before pandemic and what it's like now. And then also what your new job is like, because the cruise industry is kind of kaput right now. But you know what? It could be interesting if it comes back or if it doesn't. Talk about those things. Um, well, for the cruising industry, they're actually slowly starting to come back now. And for my books, the traveling kind of before the pandemic was being able to have a lot more, of course, freedom of kind of places to go and explore and see in the world. And now it's kind of like kind of selective to right now, a lot of the Caribbean and Alaska starting next next couple of weeks or so that they're going to be starting back up to Alaska runs. And my new job right now is starting to get into traveling the travel selling of different products, cruises, land travel, and all kinds of things like that. So Tosh and Terry, you guys like to travel. Uh, you, uh, I think Terry's been on cruise ships, right? Am I right, Terry? No, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm kind of like <laughs> weird about, can you see me? I, I'm, to, I'm having technical difficulties today. Um, no, I'm not, I've never been on a cruise. But you like to travel. I like to travel, but I claustrophobic. I think. But I, and we got, we, we got issues with your audio on that. 
Let's come back to you. Tosh, go to you. You just came back from traveling. Okay. Yes. Well, I haven't traveled yet, but I love cruises. So wait a minute. No, that's not true. You were where did you go with your mom? I haven't gone yet. I'm going in two weeks to No, no, no. What country what country did you go to? Oh, Colombia. Uh -huh. February. <laughs> that was this year still. Come on now. That's it, was, traveling. it was this year. Yes, yes. But Talk I haven't about been what on that a was cruise. Like. Oh my God. Right. Okay. So there's so much going on here. I talk about vacations and cruises and I'm excited. Um, so traveling to Colombia was very weird, like pre, like after the pandemic and before the pandemic, because everywhere, I feel like in Colombia, they're more stricter than in the U.S. Um, everywhere I had to get like a temperature check. Um, like they're super, like, uh, very hard on social distancing, like masks everywhere. So it was definitely very odd, uh, traveling to Colombia, like, but I loved it. It was great. Um, I definitely need to go back again, but I honestly, I love traveling. I, I love traveling cruises. I'm telling you, I'm a die harder cruise. I've been to six cruises in the life so far. Definitely want to try more. But would you feel comfortable going on a cruise? I, I loved going on cruises too. I've been to the Bahamas and the Caribbean and, and uh, I, I'd be scared to death to go on a cruise after hearing the horror stories, you know, of the last uh, couple of years. That's and, and, true. And Andrew, would you yeah. back on, on a boat like that? And do you feel safe? Uh, yeah, I would nowadays because a lot of the cruise lines are now specifying that passengers have to be vaccinated to get on them now versus before where they really didn't know anything at that point when stuff was happening. But now with that new, with the vaccines out there, they're a lot safer now compared to the way they were thinking that it was going to come back. So Kyle, talk about this, the new filmmaking, you know, with COVID-19, anything like that, as that filmmaker, what do you, what was it like when you were traveling down to the South, but also, <laughs> What is it like shooting for the future now for films? Well, I'm, you know, luck, I, I, luckily, but my filming aspect, luckily, was I missed it was before COVID, and then and now hopefully the next thing I film, it, you know, hopefully we'll have finished this, you know, this whole thing and we'll have it under control. Um, but you know, you know, it was I did have to shoot all of my 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 in my 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 stuff to the camera during COVID. And it was weird because, you know, we, you know, everyone was super hyper aware of the six, six feet. Um, the masks, I couldn't wear a mask. Obviously I'm talking to the camera, but everyone else is wearing masks. You feel, you, just feel like you, you don't want it to be a, you know, you want, you're making a movie and it's, it's supposed to, you know, it's a, it's a light kind of thing and in your head. You're like, am I causing somebody to get sick here? And it's, and it was scary. And I know a lot of friends in the industry that like, during when they first started going back like how serious the, the the covid um you know the protocols were getting tested and keeping people away and you know certain people were only allowed on set and you know it, it changed things drastically um uh, but hopefully hopefully you know the next time i my next project will be back to sort of going crazy and you know being right two feet from everyone Exactly, because now you might or might not have to deal with extra insurance when it comes to that now, right? Oh, yeah, that's that, that I didn't even think of that. Great. Now, and, not one more thing to keep me up at night, Brian. Thank you. Exactly. I mean, this is what, again, you know, I tell filmmakers, I mean, future filmmakers and people doing these things, these are what, this is, these are what you guys have to go through now. You know, yeah. Mike and I, we just have to sit back and watch the stuff at home, but there is that thing of going to the theaters. Yes, I finally broke down and I went to the theaters and I can tell you how many people were in the theaters, what it was like. Mike, you haven't gone back yet, right? I have, I have. Oh, that's right, you did go. Talk about your experience. I went to uh, uh, the, the the sequel to um, um, with The Quiet Place. And Quiet Place uh, it was, oh my God, yeah, such an amazing yeah. movie. Oh. It was really good. And and there were six people in the theater. I mean, there were, you know, it was in, in the, the early, part of the day on a Tuesday and um, half price tickets. And uh, it was great. Uh, and um, I also saw Cruella, which was amazing too. I was kind of blown away at how good that was. Mike, so for me, out of curiosity. Oh, Ooh, sorry. I, w I just okay, want to ask just, um, which one out of the two, like the Quiet Place one or the Quiet Place two that you enjoy the most? 
I, you know, they're such different movies. They really yes. are different movies. Yes. And and <clears throat> it it's amazing because it's written by the same guy and and you know, but uh, I I enjoyed the second one better, but I was so blown away by the first one. So get out uh, of here! You like the yes. second one? No, that second one's a piece of yeah. crap. No, the first one was no. the best one. Yes, well, and, and let me let me tell you why. Let me tell you why the first one was good. <laughs> because it was all about being quiet. It was soft. It was really. Spooky so and the eerie. One. The first one was no, impa the, very No, nah, the second the one I saw it coming, I was yawning. You remember Bill, Mike, when we, we the three of us used to sit together, Bill would have walked out of that film. I was yawning. <laughs> I saw everything coming. No, it was the first one that kept you on it. I saw two different films. Andrew, you like movies too, don't you? Yeah. Did you see A Quiet Place? Did you stream it? Because he's up in Canada because he couldn't go to the theaters, I don't think. No, we only recently just got back our theaters like within the last couple of weeks. Are you going? Wow. Are you gonna still um, say it? I'm probably. I want to go and see, uh, like the new Fast and Furious film. Mm. I want to see that too. I okay, just saw, I saw the that first, first movie. I just went to on, on Sunday. I saw the Black Widow, um, and I was I was oddly emotional in the theater as I was sitting there and the preview started because it's been a year and a half, and I would go, you know, three, four to me and Mike would go, you know, every couple times a week. We just walked out, and it was an oddly emotional feeling of like really missing that communal sort of get being together and, and, and watching a movie together as opposed to you know sitting in your bed watching it on netflix yeah kyle and i lived lived a couple of blocks away from the as brian knows this from the chinese theater you know the, the most famous theater in the world the grauman's chinese theater and uh it's such a spectacular place to watch movies um yeah so andrew and tosh here was the here was the rundown on things the last time you know uh, Kyle and I, and then Mike and I saw each other. We weren't going to the movies until at least the earliest, the end of the summer. That was the scenario, if we were going to go at all, <laughs> because we just weren't feeling safe, plus we were getting the links. But as time went on, you know, I was bored. I got back into Los Angeles beginning of May. There's nothing to do. Everything is kind of limited. I'm like, and I got my movie passes, and I'm going to Lindley because I, I missed the popcorn. For me not to have popcorn for a year and a half, that's like... <laughs> I was going nuts because I that, it's about the popcorn and getting away from me. So what did I go see? A Quiet Place too, and I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" So, but I was I, I felt good in the theater. I was happy. There was only four people. I took my Lysol. Yes, I sprayed the chairs because that's just me. I'm a clean black guy. You know, I like to be safe and everything like that. But that was me. And but I was like, I I. I felt bad for the theaters because I love to help the Lindley, the Lindley theater chain because you got to keep these things going because again, Kyle's livelihood depends on us going to see these films as everybody wants to see them in the, on the big screen. Right, Kyle? There's nothing like it. I mean, you know, it's funny. I see my kids and they'll, and they'll watch movies on a laptop and sometimes like, you know, on their, phone. on their phones. And I, like, to me, it's like, you know, like, no, you just, you know, <laughs> You can't. And in fact, we're like, oh, let's watch Black Widow. My family was like, what's Black Widow at home? You can watch on Disney Plus. I'm like, no, that you can. There's certain, listen, you want to see like, you know, my dinner with Andre, you can watch it on your laptop. But if you're going to see a Marvel movie or, 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 or a quiet, like, it has to be in the theater with the lights and people around you. And, you know, and then, although, you know, I also didn't miss everybody like in front of me on their phones, you know, texting and, and, and updating their Facebook. Like, I can't comprehend why they think they're so important. They can't wait 90 minutes before they respond to liking somebody's, you know, uh, fish plate that they got at the restaurant. That's when I throw popcorn at them. Because yeah, Tosh, yeah. Tosh would do that, wouldn't you, Tosh? Oh, wow, Brian, putting me on the spot like that. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I do, I do got to say, one of my favorite See? things about being in a movie theater, <laughs> one of my favorite things about being in a movie theater is honestly, like, when I go watch scary movies, it's just seeing like everybody's reaction in the audience like i i live for the you know people are like oh, yeah. like you know it's like it acts in C to be and it's just like oh, God. maybe if you're with your family or something but like it's so much it's such a better experience to watch it with a group of just people that you don't know and like you're all enjoying the same movie is it's pretty awesome. I, I, I really hope movie theaters never, ever die because that is one thing that I definitely think everybody needs to experience in their life. 
What for, a, for a long time, I used to go to the Magic Johnson theaters to, for a scary movie because that was in Culver City or the, you know, the uh, Westchester area. And, and, you know, you'd have the African-American crowd, you know, talking to the screen all through the horror movies, yeah. like, don't go in there. Don't go in there, girl. And it's just so funny. I love that. <laughs> and, Andrew, do you talk to the screen too in Canada? I have a feeling you uh, do. No. <laughs> no. Are you sure? Yeah, usually not till I can watch like the DVD at home later. Okay. Oh, that's good. That that's a good thing. All right. So, what was it like? Because I'm we haven't been out to Canada because the obviously the borders been closed or anything. But I used to look, you know, Mike and I going to Toronto Film Festival and seeing films in there because we just I love that town. I love going to there. So, what is it like to go to the theater in Canada right now? Um, it's barely just started back for us. So it's like only a certain percent capacity right now for us. Do you have mm. to wear masks all the way through it? <clears throat> yeah. Do you have to wear masks in California? Yeah, yeah. Um, except when you're eating. And so I always get the big tub of popcorn. So I'm always eating. <laughs> so Terry, you joined us back. We got audio with you, Terry, now. Yeah, I think so. I was trying to use my iPad and um, I got stuck on a meeting and I just was I having trouble with my internet today. So I apologize. We don't care about that. We're talking about movies. Terry hasn't yeah, been to the movies. I'm, ba I'm back. <laughs> hey, so would you go to a movie now, Terry, nonstop? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. I don't uh, have a pro I don't have a problem going now. I I, mm -hmm. I I was I was you know just and, and I was one of those. I gotta say I think I was one of the first to go back and I didn't expect that to happen. But I kept thinking of those independent filmmakers where the films aren't being seen. And Kyle, that bothers me because, mm -hmm. and Mike knows this, here we are watching the links and the things are going on BOD, which is nice, but this is not necessarily how you want to see your film, is it? No. No, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting making a film during the pandemic, trying to get a film ready. You know, normally when I'm editing it and I get to a, a cut, I will, I will have a screening. Um, you know, with people in an in the theater, and I was sitting back, and you you can watch people like you were saying, um, Tosh earlier, people getting excited about in the theater. You can sort of see the reaction if your movie is going, and people are laughing when they're supposed to, if they're getting bored and fidgeting. During this, I, I, you know, I didn't have that ability, to, so I would send my movie to people, and but I don't know if they're watching, and I can't tell when they're. So it was really hard to get an, a gauge as to whether or not um, people were responding to it in Meridian in Mississippi was the very first time, you know, I, I had a chance to do that. And normally, you know, I would, you know, Mike knows we would have screenings, you know, with my other movies and, and early and people would come and you sort of, and then you can edit it based on what's not happening. Oh, this, it, it lags here. Let me cut like a few minutes off that. And I wasn't able to do that. Um, so, you know, and, and it scares me that um, independent film, film theaters were going away to begin with. And now after this last year and a half, my worry is that, you know, you know, so many of them have closed and will they come back? And and now I, I hope people aren't used to and are okay with just watching the stuff at home. Because I love watching at home. I love the accessibility of it. But it's just, just not the same thing. Um, if, if you think about it, there's movies like, I mean, I think, uh, you know, people didn't like Nomadland, for example, because they didn't see it in a theater. That movie would have been so much better had I seen it in a theater because I wouldn't have been as bored. I mean, you know, it's, it's black and white. And it's very different to see a black and white kind of more film. You know, the, the tones were black and white in a, in a theater than it would be. There's, there's a lot of movies that, that came out in the last year that I saw on TV that I kept thinking to myself, I would have liked this a lot more if I saw it in the theater. I would have liked Nomadland a lot more had I not seen it. <laughs> I, 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 I the agree. Theaters or not. <laughs> so this goes this goes to Tosh and Andrew on this one. So you guys are the demos that people are wanting to get back to the theaters. So Tosh, would you pay to go see an independent film fourteen dollars that you've never heard of? That's the question. I mean, yeah, because I already pay that to watch a movie that I mm -hmm. want to see. So it's the same. It's the same price, you know. I just don't know what this movie is about, but I. Okay. See, that's the correct answer. I didn't yeah. expect her to say that. See, I, there's a one. There's a good reason why I like vocally, Tosh. So, <laughs> have a, have a little Brian, I paid that. 
I've paid that at home to rent movies at home during pan during the pandemic. I paid 14, 15, 20 bucks to, to, to watch a movie that I've kind of scrolled through that. Oh, this looks interesting. I'll watch this. Mm -hmm. See, I don't, stuff I won't, I won't do that. I refuse to stuff, do that. Stuff that I didn't even think I would watch. There was something on, and I can't remember the name of it, but I think it was called the ghost of something. And it was a documentary of this guy who went around to like haunted. He's a filmmaker and he did zombie movies and that was not doing well. So he started going around to places where there was murders to see if there was um, para paranormal, is a paranormal, paranormal uh, activity. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it was really cool because he would set up these cameras and weird stuff would happen at night where tables would move and all these weird things. I mean, so you don't know if it was a setup and really did it or if these things really happened, but it was entertaining no matter what. And I th I think it was the ghost of Mrs. Something and a cow. It's going to drive me crazy. You know, it's on um, Amazon Prime. And, and so so Kyle mm -hmm. and Michael and, and even Andrew on this one, this is one of those films because it's called, I think it's The Conjuring. Uh, something mm -hmm. the real the real life story of the conjuring because I'm waiting to interview that director. Uh, I think I next that. week, and it and it is what you described, Terry. It's a documentary mm -hmm. on that, and it's actually interesting because it's at the real life house. I think it's in New Hampshire, uh, yeah, which is, is really one interesting. Scary movie. Uh, it can be exactly, and they're gonna have another one, so it's gonna be number five. So you know, horror never goes out. But here's the thing: you're not gonna catch me paying fourteen dollars. For a, a film that I one I can see for free with the link, I'll take the link over to pay fourteen dollars. But I would pay that if I know this film is actually good to go. And I have to remember this: I'm supporting the independent filmmaker, and that's 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 a lot. I have to remember that I'm doing it for that filmmaker and the people who worked on it. That's how I see it. Mike, you feel the same way because you go back and forth on what movies you're going to pay to see when we were locked down because we get the links. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and. Uh... Yeah, and I'll and I'll pay for you know bad movies too. Um, I like I like my my bad movies. I I paid for uh, Bai Ling's uh, uh, Exorcism at sixty thousand feet. <laughs> yeah, that, but that's because we like Bai Ling though. <laughs> Wait, I, <laughs> I I googled it, Brian. It was called the Blackwell Ghost. Oh yeah. And each segment is like five dollars, and I think and there's maybe ten segments, and I think I rented like. Almost all of them because I because I got glued to it. So Kyle, let me ask you. It. it was good, huh? It was worth it. To me, it was worth it. But I like I like scary movies. I like that kind of stuff. So for somebody who likes that's into paranormal, it's interested in that kind of stuff. It's very it it was good. Yeah, I would. I mean, I watched the first one and then I got hooked and then I just kept kept going and it was like five or six dollars for each one. So I mean, I it was kind of interesting the way he did it because it was an in, it was a it's an independent film. And I think he it was in two hundred seven it came out, but the way he did it caught you. You know what I mean? So you had to keep buying the next part of his film. <laughs> but it it was to me. I don't know. I loved it. Good. So Kyle, does that give you hope knowing that? people are willing to spend some money on an independent film, say like yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does give me hope. And I, and I do think as an independent filmmaker, you know, streaming services, they're kind of a, a mixed bag because on some level, I was just saying, I love going to the theaters. Nothing beats it. However, for, for independent films, um, for the most part, art house movies, they're only in mo major metropolitan cities. So it's really hard for people outside of, you know, these, these cities that have art houses. I mean, we're, I was lucky in L.A. there were a ton. But if I'm living in, if I'm living in Mississippi and I want to see a white man walks into a barbershop, it'll never come into my town. So streaming services give the independent filmmaker access to a much wider audience than we normally get. And my films have always been about um, sort of. A certain a segment of, of the population that doesn't get um, represented a lot men I mean women people of color LGBT communities and um, you know is that you Mike no oh I just assumed you you know you you the police were after you again no, well, it, might, it, might, it, might, it might be me I'm the person of color in this one <laughs> that's that's right that's right there's another my next movie for you Brian <laughs> So, you know, so so I like the streaming for independent filmmakers because you can get the stuff out there that would normally never get seen um, and find an audience. So, Kyle, let me ask you this one. So when it comes to books, nonfiction or fiction, if you see something and you want it to turn it into a film, what's the process of that? 
Uh, the process is, and there's a couple books I'm, I'm actually thinking about um, doing that with, actually. The process would first would be to see if, if, the, if the rights are available. Um, a lot of times, uh, high, 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 well-known, um, high-profile books get picked up and, and, and uh, optioned long before they're even released. You know, producers get like what they're called galleys. They get like, you know, the, the book six, eight months before and it gets picked up. But if it's an obscure book, if it's a book no one knows of, I would reach out and I would try to find if that um, if the book was available. You know, if you could reach out to the, 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 the author directly, I always find that's better because especially nowadays you can because of social media, because oftentimes an agent or manager will be sort of you know, sort of a roadblock to someone you may connect with as an author and a filmmaker saying, hey, I want to work with this guy. Um, and if they are, if the rights are available, you make a deal and option it for, usually it's about a year. Say, look, I'll give you five grand. I, 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 I have a year to find the financing for this movie. And then they get the money one way or the other. And if I do get the financing, they get much more. And that's sort of the process um, uh, you, would, you would go along with it. Andrew, how's that sound to you? What do you think of what you just heard? Yeah, I think it's a good idea for any kind of person that's trying to get a book turned into a movie, like with a real good idea, like anybody's kind of idea that would be a good film would should do well in becoming a movie if the book's really well written. So you being, I was surprised because when I first started interviewing you, I was like, I didn't know he wrote two books. I knew he had one, which is an international bestseller, but I didn't know about two and I just didn't know. And then, so Andrew, when you went to Europe, before you wrote this book, talk about how that came about and you're going to get ready to go sometime within the next couple months, I think between now and the end of the year, talk about that. Um, well, for the next trip is next year to go back to Europe and explore more of Europe that I haven't seen yet. And currently it's that the kind of the thought of writing the books was more about finding something to do during the pandemic and trying to find a way to be kept busy while being in the middle of all the pandemic out there. And talk about Hasmark. So Hasmark picked up your book and you got an yeah. ER in your book too, right? Talk about that. Yeah, I got, yeah, I got picked up on the first one with them, and then the second one I brought to them, and they said they'd be more than happy to publish the second one as well. Can I ask okay. about traveling? I'd, I'd really like to know, like, uh, is it, <clears throat> is it how hard is it to be on an airplane now? And and you know, the, you hear all these stories now about people not wearing masks and everything, or and is the mask thing going to end soon? Um, I, I just, I, I haven't been on a plane for, you know, a year and a half and I, I'd like to know what it's like now. I mean, has, who's been on a plane? I was on a plane last week. And how did that go? Um, LAS is a mess. <laughs> LAX yeah. is- It always is. Huh? <laughs> it always is. Well, I mean, it's basically back to where it was before COVID. There's like everybody, I just felt like it was just so many people there. It was crazy. How long did it take to get through? to get through security. security. Uh, I was only going to Sacramento. So it just took me maybe like 15 minutes, I think to okay. go through security, but I left in the morning, but the plane was packed. And then on my way back, or when I got to Sacramento, when I went to get my rent a car, they packed everybody in the bus. Um, I mean, everybody's wearing masks and stuff, but they're packing everybody on the planes and everything. So I don't know. It's me, if, we, if people weren't wearing the masks, you wouldn't know there was COVID. Because everything's pretty back to much back to normal at the airport. Hmm. So my first time um, on a plane was when I went to Colombia and we had to like wear masks, and I got so much anxiety on that plane. I don't know why, but like I felt like I couldn't breathe. Like the AC wasn't working. Like my, my mom was like, "Natasha, you need to calm down." I was like, "I feel like asphyxiated." You know? I how was, long were you? How how long was the flight? It was only two and a half hours, which usually I'm fine with, but I don't know if it was because, you know, you had to have the mask on. They were very, like, if you put it down, like, you can get kicked out of, like, the plane or, you or like, in the future. So it was just, like, it was, it was weird. It was weird. Like, I think twice now, if I want to go travel somewhere that's, like, really long. Um, <clears throat> but you know what it I'll is, Tosh? Some people I get anxiety from those things because... 
So with that, let's show our popper and Barkley. For those people who get anxiety and suffer from depression, let's let's show our popper and Barkley image here. And by the way, you get 15% off. Do you, is, but then movie oh, reviews and more. Popper and Barkley, yes. <laughs> so Tosh. <laughs> Good job, right now it's nice. Anybody, next time you take a trip, take some popper yes. and Barkley with you. I got my pills, I got my sleeping relaxed pills which I didn't have when I went to Colombia. So that's what I use them for when I get like, you know, really anxious. I just like, it calms me down. Yeah, because so. when you fly that long wearing the mask, I mean, I get anxious, just, I get anxious. So I've taken the part, I've taken that product before for my anxiety, it works. And Andrew, you're going to Europe, right? I mean, so- Yeah, how I'm are you hoping to go to that? Europe next year, yeah. You think it's gonna, I mean, how, how are you gonna deal with that? Um, I think hopefully by then a lot more will be done in the way of like vaccinations and maybe loosening of some of the rules as well to be able to go out there and just enjoy Europe for what it is. I'm so flying next week to California and I'm not worried about uh, the mask thing doesn't worry me. I'm, I'm actually I have anxiety that there's going to be like an, uh, an idiotic anti-vaxxer, anti-max person who's going to make a big set scene and, I, and oh, I'm going to be called upon to be a hero. And Michael will tell you, I'm a no hero. So it's that. that no, I can see I, you being the hero. That's the problem. That? <laughs> I can see you being the hero. And that's no, the problem. So, so that's that. I worry about sort of people's behavior. I think people are sort of losing their minds. Like they think that there's this, there's the, that's being on a, being, you know, 30,000, 30, 30, 30, 30 feet, 30,000 feet in the air is the time to make a political statement about, you know, you know, science doesn't work. So that's my bigger fear. Andrew, let me ask you this. So when people are starting the book now, whether it's for between now and the end of the year or next year, how, how, as that travel and cruise consultant, what do you say to them to book these flights or these, these cruise ships? Um, well, a lot of the time it's, um, of course, like the people looking for cruises, they're, of course, they're worried about like how things will be when they travel, but a lot of things now with the cruising is heavily now is vaccinated and they're always improving every day their tactics with their controlling of COVID and everything. Hey, do you got any of your books on you? Sorry, guys. Yeah. I, I, Andrew, have they figured out a way? Because the, the, with the cruising, I think this. The, the thing that worries me too is those those cruises that got stuck out and they couldn't come back into May. That's the scary part. If they figured that out, like I would be worried about going on a cruise unless they could guarantee, even if God forbid something happens, you're not going to be stuck here for weeks. Have they figured that out yet or no? Yeah, a lot of the people now, like if they are um, like COVID positive, they're like at the next port, they'll, they'll take those people off. And then so they'll, crews can continue without any issues. Well, there you go, Kyle. I think you got an a, a independent film coming up on what it might be like to take a cruise or what it might be like to travel a lot to South the U.S. Because I'm going outside the U.S. That's a good one. It sounds like a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> the me in a bathing suit is a horror film. Trust me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what's everybody been watching? we got about six minutes left. So I was talking about The Godfather of Harlem, which is on Epix. Uh, I mean, I wasn't watching Epix. It's part of the stars um, system and everything like that. But it's a really, really good series. I don't know if anybody's seen that. And then I actually watched War of the Worlds. Mike, have you seen that? War of the Worlds? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great series on epics. Believe it or not, they got no, some great yeah, things. Yeah. Oh, really? So I, you know what? I love Manifest and Debris, and I'm so pissed off that oh, you know, NBC for canceling both of those. Damn it! They're they're they canceled both, and I love both of them, and I hate Net NBC now. Well, I'm still stuck with NBC for the Blacklist. I'll suffer through it for the last. I don't know. I'm yeah, it was the out. last season, but they announced the last season. I mean, they ended both bo both of those two shows, and you don't know what the hell's happening now. Oh, well, I could tell you. But anyhow, Tosh, talk about Manifest, because I, I heard that you like that. Oh, yes. I'm actually on season two right now. I just got hooked on it last week, and I watched all the season one last week. So now that you're saying that they're not going to continue, kind of breaks my heart. I'm like, am I watching this for, like, no reason now? <laughs> they say, they may, they I, say I, they may have a movie that ends the whole thing, so. Oh, okay. In other well, words, talking, keep with it. 
Brian, so there's this movie on Amazon Prime, and everybody should see it because it's really freaking good, called Tomorrow's War. Tomorrow's War, I saw it. It's wow, excellent. wow. Mike, I have you seen that yet? Movie. Kyle, seen it yet? Terry, you seen it yet? Uh, Andrew, it? you seen it yet? Uh, nope. Nope. It's got what Chris Pratt. It's an excellent film. It's oh, right I on the mark. It's good? Yeah, it's very, yes. very good. It oh, you know what? So I fell good. asleep on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I want to know what you're watching in Canada. What are you um, watching online? <laughs> no way. Um, before, like at one point, I was watching like the Fast and Furious films. Like they had at one point, they had that on streaming up here for a bit. And now it's just like kind of looking for kind of good movies that are on there and kind of taking a watch of some of the other good films up here. Yeah, that makes sense because you're getting them as, in a slower release. I didn't know this. Kyle, did you know this, that some of most of Netflix stuff on the American side, don't go to Canada. Did you know that? No, really? Yeah. No, I did they, that, man. I didn't realize they're, that. They're only allowed to show so many American films on Netflix. Oh, because oh, oh, they want more Canadian product on their thing. That's interesting. So how do they choose which movies that make the, the cut? Because Netflix has a billion, and they're well, mostly American. That's where we come in inside of Filter Mountain and, and, and get pissed off at people that they need to have these films seen all over the place. That's right. That's the issue. That's the issue because, like I said, I wasn't watching Amazon Prime until I blamed that on Trixie. She turned me on to Amazon Prime, so now I'm I'm watching everything that I can, and then I switch over and I went over to X, you know, Epic. So I did the five day free trial. I'm like, I'm watching everything in five days because this is great stuff. Because I refuse to pay fourteen dollars for something, that's why I'd rather go and see it in the big screen. So I'm still that old traditional. I will go and see it in the movies. I won't be like Tosh and have my phone ringing, even though the phone is ringing with the sun vibrate. Yeah, I see you smiling, Tosh. You know it's true, don't you? <laughs> Today is. Hit on Tosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. All right, so we got a couple of minutes left. All right, so to recap, Tyle, give uh, a scenario of where a white man walks into a barbershop is heading next, and what do you think is going to happen with that later? Um, it'll be in uh, – it's it's going to be the beginning of August. We don't know the exact date at the uh, Hip Hop um, Film Festival in uh, New York, and then it's going to do a screening in New Jersey. We're going to do uh, Montgomery, Alabama, Minnesota, um, L.A., probably Chicago, and then um, a few other places between now and October, November. It'll be on a number of streaming services. Not exactly sure which ones yet. Um, uh, probably Definitely on um, uh, iTunes and Google Play, but also perhaps one of the bigger ones um, as well. But uh, look for look for that to be available widely in November. And I'll we'll let you know, Brian, and you can let all of your adoring fans know all about it. And let us know when it, when you're when it's uh, that premiere is in in, in uh, L.A. Okay, is it going to Florida at all? I uh, just I'm afraid of Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, too, too bad, Tosh. <laughs> oh wait, where are you, Tosh? She's in Florida. I'm in Miami. I'm oh, Miami is different. We'll go. With, we'll definitely go to Miami. Miami's Miami is a whole Miami. different country. <laughs> Miami is not <laughs> Florida. <laughs> Miami is right. its own thing. Exactly. Well, Tasha, if he goes to Florida, if he goes to Miami, I'll let you know. Or, or who knows, she may be yes. coming out to one of the L.A. shows pretty soon. Uh, Michael, real quickly, talk about what you got coming up. And you just saw something else, too, I think. Uh, I'm... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Movie-wise. Uh, movies? What? I, I don't know what I'm seeing. Uh, there's... there's. Um... You, you sent me a link to something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't seen it yet, though. Uh, but uh, the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival Outfest is coming up soon, um, and uh, I've got another Dachshund book in the works coming up let soon. Us, let us know when it's coming. All right, okay. Tosh, what's coming on with you? Well, with me, so on Thursday, I'm getting into the studio of recording a new song, so that is exciting. Um, I feel like being back in a Recording studio feels so so comfortable and such like a, a home away from home. So I'm super excited. Um, for all of you, I am a Latin pop singer. Uh, I sing only Spanish songs. Uh, kind of the vibes of like Shakira, J Lo. Oh, oh, um, 
Oh, and did we lose her? Oh, oh, no. You got lost me the whole time. Nah. <laughs> okay, Andrew, let's talk about your books real quick and where people can see them and Hasmark. Um, on both my books are available on Amazon. A Visual Journey to Alaska and A Visual Journey to the Caribbean are both available on Amazon. And Hasmark is a great company for uh, putting books out, helping publish new books and everything. See that, Kyle? You may have an outlet to any of the books to, to these authors that we're talking to. Just keep that in mind. Uh, believe me, <laughs> I'm already making mental notes. And I also and I know where to go for my, for my uh, music and my next film. I'm going to go exactly. right now. Exactly. And all right, Terry, so you're training today. You're going to train afterwards? Yeah, I'm going to train afterwards, but I have an announcement to let you know, Brian, before I don't even know. Well, yeah, I told you about this before. I'm going to be in a rock video with Wicked Star. We're filming it in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be playing at the Whiskey on Thursday night. So I'm going to go there, and they're going to bring me up on stage <laughs> so, to oh, dance with them. So if you're in L.A., come check out Wicked Star at the Whiskey Go Go. And um, I'm training for my next show. Um, I talked with Mustafa, who's my trainer. So he said, I'll be ready in three months. And then it's like, I'm probably going to do a show in three months. And then I'll do another show in six months. My first show, haven't done a show in two years. So I'm not even planning on placing. I just want to get back up on stage. And then um, my show after that, which probably in January, I'll be looking to place first, second, or third place. That's my goal. So that is where I am right now. All right. Yeah. And I want to thank everybody from coming on. Kyle, Kyle, well, thank you for coming on and, and with your film because it is a really good film. And Andrew King, thank you for coming on because uh, you've been waiting for this for months and we'll have you back again because I want to know what's happening with cruise ships and travel uh, around <laughs> the world. I want to pay attention to that. And so for everybody, I want to thank Gloria for chiming in. And if you see someone without a smile, please tell them that everybody needs to smile out there. We all need that. And if you see someone with an one, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. I'm Brian Sebastian, movie reviews and more, and we'll see you next week.